this set of videos is over factoring polynomials, but before we get into that, let's go ahead and review what we know about polynomials so far. So in your last assignment, you learned how to name polynomials, and you learned that is dependent upon the degree or the highest exponent of the polynomial, as well as the number of terms in the polynomial that gives the polynomial its first and last name. We covered how to add and subtract polynomials, and the process to that is just combining like terms. And we learned how to multiply polynomials. And we learned there was a few special cases of that. We used the word um, distributing when we multiplied a monomial by anything else, or we used the word foiling when we multiplied a binomial times a binomial, or a two by two. And in any other situation, we learned just to multiply out each term of the first polynomial times each term of the second polynomial. So you're probably thinking, well, if I learned how to add, subtract, and multiply polynomials, why is my next step not dividing polynomials? And let me walk through the difference between dividing something and factoring something, and hopefully that answers the question that I've just posed. So I have an example here. I want to factor the number 24, and I want to divide the number 24. Now, when I factor 24, I can factor it quite a few different ways. All I'm trying to do is think about each number that goes into 24 evenly. So I can factor it as something like 3 times 8, or 2 times 12, or 6 times 4. And if I wanted to take 24 down into its prime factorization, then I would need to take each of those down farther. So I'm going to go ahead and do that, take it down to its prime factorization, and I'm going to choose 6 times 4. But if you wanted to do it by using one of the other factors that we've listed there, it's all going to work out the same way. So 24, let me write it as 6 times 4. And then 6, I'll write it as 2 times 3. And 4, I'll write it as 2 times 2. So the prime factorization of 24 is 2 times 2 times 2 times 3, just putting it in numerical order. Or I could think of it as 2 cubed times 3 if I want to write it in the condensed version. So there's an example of factoring a number, factoring 24. Now, in example 2, if I asked you to divide 24, I hope your response would be, by what? So in example 2, I haven't really given you enough information. When the problem specifically says divide something, it needs to say by whatever number we're trying to divide it by. So I could pick any one of these numbers over here to divide it to come out evenly, or I could pick any other number. Just note that my answer will not be a whole number in that situation. So this is the reason that we are choosing to factor polynomials over dividing polynomials. Because when we factor them, we can go about it many different routes. And when we are dividing it, it's very specified what route that we need to take. And we want to be as flexible as possible. So we do not want to be mandated what to divide it by. We want to just divide it on our own time. And so that's why we factor polynomials instead of dividing polynomials. So now that we know why we're factoring polynomials, let's go ahead and go into our first factoring technique. And that technique is called the common factor. Now, a key thing that goes along with common factor is that you should always look for this factoring technique first. Even when I go into other factoring techniques, my first question still should be, can I factor it by pulling out a common factor? And if the answer is yes, then you should do this technique before we move on to any other factoring techniques. And for some reason, even though this is the first process that you should be looking for, this always ends up being one of the last things that students think of. And I think it is because this is the only factoring method 
that doesn't end with two sets of parentheses. So I think that students get in such a habit of setting up two sets of parentheses that they forget to focus on the common factor technique. So I will try to remind you of this process as much as possible, but it is your own responsibility to remind yourself to do this first and always first. What we do in the common factor technique is we just look for anything that's in common between all of our terms. So we're just going to start by looking at example one here. I notice that I have two terms, a 3x squared and a 9. And I notice that between those two terms, I have a common factor of 3. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to factor out my common factor of 3. And so that leaves me with whatever I have left. Now, I've compared factoring and dividing before, and basically factoring is a way of dividing it. It's just not mandating what we divide it by. And the reason that it is is because to come up with what I have left here is I just take each term individually, and I mentally divide it by whatever I have factored out. So if I take a 3x squared and divide it by 3, that leaves me with just x squared. I have a plus in the middle. And now if I take a 9 and divide it by 3, that leaves me with a 3. And so I have factored this example by using my common factor technique. I've pulled out all of my common factors. Now, a couple of extra things to go along with this. When you think you are finished by doing the common factor technique, double check to make sure that you don't have anything else left in common. That is something that students miss, is they pull out something in common, but not always the largest common factor. And the other thing that I want to specify here is factoring, like division, is the opposite of multiplying. So I can always check any factoring technique by multiplying this out. And in this example, since I have a monomial times something else, the way I'm going to check this one is by distributing. So your common factor technique is the exact opposite of multiplying by distributing. And so my final answer and this guy here is 3 times x squared plus 3. And if I distributed that 3 back through, I would get the same thing as my problem, which means I have factored it correctly. So let's switch over to example 2. And I suggest that you pause the video to see if you can factor this one by using your common factor technique. So here you should notice that there's three terms, and we want to pull out the largest common factor in these three terms. So the first thing that you might have noticed is that there is a 5 in common. So you might have picked out that 5 is your common factor. If you did that, you should be left with x to the 6 plus 2x to the 4th plus x squared. And so you have factored it by common factor. But if you looked a little bit farther, not only in these three terms do I have a 5 in common, but I also have an x in common. So don't forget to keep checking to make sure that you've pulled out the largest common factor. And in fact, I have two x's in common between all of these. So instead of looking at it like this, I'm going to pull out a 5 and an x squared. That leaves me with x to the 4th plus 2x squared. And you might think that you're done here, because in our last piece, if I had a 5x squared and you factored out a 5x squared, you might think that you don't have anything left. But remember, this is division. So 5x squared divided by 5x squared leaves you with a 1 left. So if you start with three terms after your common factor technique, you should end with three terms still. And double check, did I pull out everything in common? I don't have anything left in common. So this here is my final answer. And you can always check these. Specifically in common factor, you check it by distributing. 
If I distributed that 5x squared back through, I should end up with my original problem. This is where I'm going to stop this video, and in the next video, we're going to be learning some more factoring techniques. And trust me, those techniques are going to be more complicated than this one here of common factor.